Um, so yeah, I will uh, reveal that I'm originally from Chicago, but I've uh, lived in Australia now for uh, 11 years. And yeah, most people think I'm from Ireland for some reason with my accent, so they just can't figure it out. And um, I had Mark particularly perplexed, I think. So um, yeah, I did have an interesting um, experience last week, which was really relevant to my presentation today. So I had three different trips to the hospital. And so um, it gave me plenty of time to uh, reimagine uh, what a new healthcare system could, could certainly look like. Um, the, uh, what I did learn is, although we have all this innovation happening, and uh, you know, whether it be with technology or in terms of interacting with how customers may behave, there's really no good way to get a crayon out of a two-year-old's nose. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a frustrating experience. And the, the crayon, I think, is still in there. So. Um, it's, it's, it's a small part of a crayon, not too big. So, uh, But we've got instructions to sort of sit and wait for the uh, the next week, and uh, hopefully um, she did swallow it. Uh, but yeah, no side of the crayon so far. <laughs> Great. There it is. I was looking for the clicker. So I, I just kind of, over the next 30 minutes, really what I want everyone to do is really kind of reimagine what a new healthcare environment could look like. And so I'll talk about kind of three major things that are happening. So the technology disruption that we're seeing that in, go through lots of different examples that's really, really changing uh, other industries, but now health more than it ever has before. Uh, the customer behavior as a result. So, um, and Bianca was talking a lot about this. So how are we actually changing how we interact with technology uh, as a result, and what are our changing expectations? And the third is really just some of these major global trends that are happening, whether it be around you know, increased life expectancy, uh, the rise of emerging economies, and how are they being impacted by technology disruption and customer behavior, but how are they changing them as well? So, so let's start with technology. I mean, I'm, I'm fundamentally a, a technologist by uh, nature, so I love to talk about new things that are happening in tech. And so I'm, I'm going to take a bit of, of a, a kind of a history uh, lesson here around a couple of things that have happened over the past few uh, decades, but then now what's happening around kind of new technologies that are impacting health. So um, it's useful to really think about uh, technology in, in almost like 10-year cycles when it comes to computing technology. And, you, know, you can't do this in other industries because things don't happen as fast, but if, just take a look at this around you know, where we were 50 years ago in computing technology, around kind of the mainframe computers and just kind of the green screen kind of terminals and, and, and really basic ways to interface into computers to where we're at today and where we're going. And, and so really, we talked really since about kind of 2008 to 2010 around this digital disruption concept. And that relates to things like mobile, analytics, cloud computing, um, in social media, right? And so that's actually really been the big impact. And an area of wearables has actually been a bit slow. I'll talk about that. But that's what we saw as digital disruption. What we talk about exponential disruption, that's actually really just starting to happen now. Uh, and this is really where, and I'll talk about this for health, but this is actually where the big change is going to happen with health. So you might have thought for the last you know, five years you were sort of being disrupted and all these digital changes that are happening. But the next five years is going to be, be more, right? And so it's going to be an exciting time, but it's actually going to probably be for a number of you, a pretty confusing time around, okay, well, what do I do? There's all these different things that are actually changing in my world, and how do I actually take advantage of them and also kind of manage the change over time? So um, th this picture here is um, from a, a report that we did a couple of years ago that looked at the impact of digital disruption. And so if you look on, on the kind of top left here, um, these are the industries that are going to change that have been impacted the most, right? And so we called it short fuse, big big bang. So it was actually a really quick change that happened starting around 2010, um, and, and the change was big. Um, if you look uh, on the right-hand side, the change is a little bit slower, but we also think that there's gonna be a really big change. And so these are the, the industries, and health is one of them, that are actually been sort of impacted by digital disruption, but it's exponential disruption that's the, that's the big change. And so these are technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, the fusion of genomics and technology. So really major changes that you're starting to see happen now. Uh, it's going to have a dramatic impact on health. And then some of the industries along the, uh, the bottom, they're still impacted as well, but, but not to the same extent and not as big of a change. Um, and so also with this change, it's just like useful to look at how quick things are happening. So um, going back to 2002, um, when the, the iPod came out, I'm sure everybody uh, remembers those days. Uh, it took a, a year to sell a million units. 
And so um, I know I bought mine, mine pretty early. I was pretty excited. But uh, it, you know, it took a long time for that kind of global adoption to happen. Um, in 2013, it took uh, 12 hours to sell a million units of the iPhone 4, which was just amazing. You had queues, and just people all around the world were, were completely focused around you know, how do they get the latest iteration of the iPhone, even though it actually wasn't that big of a change from the previous generation. Um, last quarter, Apple sold, I think, something like 75 million units of the iPhone 6. So uh, this change that we're seeing around the mobile, that's just one example, is, is not only happening, and it's, it's a big changes that are happening, but it's happening much faster than ever before. Um, and, and so the other thing is to think about in this device, just how powerful it is. And you know, uh, this is a, yeah, I love this uh, old Radio Shack I, I found uh, with a colleague. And you know, everything that was in this ad from 25 years ago is, is still there. Right. It's, 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 it's within a phone, though. And so everything that you can do it, you know, like you know, uh, you know, 10,000 times the processing power, uh, you can do in a single device as opposed to going out and buying all these different technologies. Um, and so uh, and, you know, it's just as amazing. Radio Shack's still around. Uh, so those of us that grew up with it in the US, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing. It's still kind of a, you know, a little bit of a bellwether electronics store. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the, the smartphone has really replaced all this capability. Uh, so with all these different technologies, then of course we're seeing, and I'm sure some of you have seen this stat before, just an incredible proliferation of data. So I think this, this is from 2014. And in those two years uh, before, we created nine times more data than any time in human history put together, right? And so um, that, that's a truly amazing statistic. And what is more amazing is you know, where we've come the last couple of years and then where we're gonna go into the future, right? So if you look at certainly in the, in the health industry, we're seeing now billions of sensor technologies being deployed around the world. So the thought is that by 2030, we'll have a trillion sensor technologies that will be in place around the world, monitoring every rich thing, you know, many of them automated in terms of their interactions with each other. So 100 devices, sensing devices for every person on Earth. Um, so that is, a, that is an amazing statistic, but it's pretty overwhelming as well. And so how do you actually kind of rationalize that in terms of what you're trying to do in this new healthcare system is, is one of the things that I actually want to kind of go through in the, in the next section on this presentation. Um, and then something that is also really emerging is you know, what we call in our, uh, in exponential technologies is the rise of sort of cognitive computing and decisions that are, you know, are being actually made to a degree by machines, right? And so you know, we, did a, uh, we were doing some work um, over the past year with uh, the VCCC. Some of that slowed down due to some, some issues out there. But um, uh, the, the plan was implementation of Watson uh, from a cognitive perspective to assist in the, the patient diagnosis, uh, diagnosis process. So that doesn't mean a computer saying, this is what, you know, this is what we do, this is what's wrong with you. The, the doctor still has that responsibility. But think of this scenario as you know, a person coming in talking about the different symptoms they have and a, an assistive technology actually uh, helping the doctor actually say these are potential issues, right? And then there's an interaction with the patient. And so this is really the way that we're seeing kind of AI and cognitive technologies being rolled out. It's not replacing everything, replacing humans. It's actually an assistive process. And so um, you know, you've probably seen uh, uh, IBM's Watson technology going back a couple of years ago. It was the it was the you know, technology that beat uh, uh, you know the, all the Jeopardy uh, uh, competitors in, in a process, right? And so uh, we we definitely see this kind of artificial intelligence being there to actually assist people in terms of making decisions. Um, so here's uh, you know, just an example of this, this sensing technology that we're seeing, and kind of coming back to my earlier comments on wearables. Uh, Part of the problem with wearables has been an energy issue and sort of like a clumsiness problem around, around the technology. So Google Glass didn't really take off. Um, I have a Fitbit um, that I, I forgot today because uh, you know, it runs out of batteries sometimes, right? So I love it. But unlike my old watch, I have to keep, keep charging it, right? And so um, things that are, you know, wearable technologies is going to be more fused to your body and can constantly monitor the interactions that you're having and look for issues and then feed that back into a central system uh, in terms of the, the, the patient is something that we see is, uh, is, is an emerging approach. And so the MC10 uh, Biosnap is just one example of that. Um, and it's sort of a, you know, a, a more uh, uh, fused look around you know, the tattoos that you see on everybody today. Um, 
so what we're really seeing are collisions, right? And so I've talked a lot about the new technologies, but then how is that coming into health? And, and the things that are happening are collisions in you know, kind of multiple technologies. So, so one is around the area of genomics and technology. And so it's just the processing power that's, that's fundamentally changed. And so uh, you know, it took uh, you know, 10 years and a billion dollars to sequence the human genome. And you know, comment on there now is it'll you know, soon be cheaper than uh, flushing a toilet, right? And so it's just the pure processing power that we've got in terms of technology that's allowing us to, to, to fundamentally uh, do analysis like we've never done before. And, and then really there's some fusions that are going on around kind of organic technology and the storage of data and then the ability to actually create things around it. And so uh, I'm sure a lot of you know uh, Greg, Greg, uh, Craig Venter and Cynthia and what they were able to do in terms of replicating basically a synthetic biological or organism. Um, and then they've been actually engaged with some companies around what that could mean from you know, everything around health research, but also into areas like climate change. So they're doing studies around algal biofuels, which was an area um, I did some work in before, uh, before my current role. So um, a lot of fascinating technology happening with these kind of areas of, of collisions. Um, the other thing we're seeing is you know, everybody's talking a lot about 3D printing, right? So two years ago, it used to be just kind of a novelty thing. You might be able to print a little device at home. Uh, I saw you can print furniture now. Uh, they've started to print 3D drugs, right? And the idea behind that is actually a very personalized drug that could actually be delivered for a patient based on the needs. So it just got FDA approved last year. Um, I don't know a lot about the technology. I actually discovered it in uh, some conversations with a colleague uh, last week, but it's just, I think the one thing that we could say, that's been FDA approved. There's probably gonna be more and more of this into the future. So, so those are the sort of the technologies that are really you know, changing things, the kind of major trends around that. Um, what is then resulting is a significant shift in customer behavior and expectations because of their use of these technologies. And they're not necessarily all you know, health technologies, they're actually things that they interact with as a consumer every day. I mean, think of how Google's changed things. And so we saw uh, Bianco's um, stories around how much people search every day, but also how they're now shifting more and more to mobile. Um, they also have a very dramatically different expectation around the accessibility to information. So um, you know, customer behavior and how it's changing is really gonna impact a lot of the, your jobs today, and it's being shaped by technology. So um, one of the things that will definitely impact this is just the, the, the generation that is you know, the digital natives, right? So they've completely grown up with digital technology. And um, you know, I, I forget a lot of times uh, talking to people on my team that are uh, 20 years younger than me now. Um, you know, you know, they've never been in a non-technology world, right? And so um, their expectations are you know, completely fused. Um, my two-year-old. She knows how to use an iPad, I'm sure like many of your kids, completely intuitively. Uh, she searches for her favorite videos every day, probably searches for things on crayons and uh, how, how to remove them. But, but you know, the, when we have complete digital natives, it, it totally changes the expectations of how they would look for information online. And they certainly want to do it through a much more kind of tactile experience through a mobile or a tablet than they would just go to a desktop computer. Um, in Australia, I've just got some statistics here. Um, so uh, I've seen once before a report that we did last year that actually Australia is actually the most digital country in the world by some measures in terms of consumer adoption of technology, but Australian companies rank 25th in the world in terms of their ability to deliver new digital technologies to those consumers. So that's just really a thinking point. We've got a major disconnect around what expectations would be and what's being delivered to consumers. Um, and, and I was at uh, one of the 97% uh, last week in terms of frustration with wait times. And, and so uh, yeah, it's not a surprise that people are frustrated with, with wait times. I, I think um, what is interesting is actually how people are then making decisions around where they would want to go into the future for doctors. And so, um, you know, 62% use online reviews as the first point of call. And at least the data I looked at from the U.S., they actually weren't, uh, the first point was not actually specialist health sites, they were actually using Yelp, right? And they were actually getting advice from, you know, many times people that they don't know, right? And so um, you've got people that are actually, probably have a little bit more distrust from traditional systems, but they're actually quite comfortable to ask somebody on Yelp that they don't know, they've never met in person, where they should go for a doctor. And so it's just sort of an interesting change that we're seeing uh, around customer behavior. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of, a, admittedly, like a bit of a prosumer market. So like, I like, um, 
new technology. I like to hack around with it. I, uh, I love um, spending time in biohacking groups on Reddit and uh, looking at how I can actually um, you know, modify different devices. And, and that's a pretty representative culture around what you see today. So people that are actually, you know, they're no longer just kind of a consumer of, of different technologies, but people that actually want to modify it for their own use. And they have very significant kind of customer demands around how that has to work for them. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that we see about this, and I was kind of alluding to this earlier, is this kind of trust paradox, right? And so we actually don't trust traditional authority figures and governments as much as we used to. So any, any kind of survey will tell you that. But we actually trust people that we don't know, kind of never met physically, much more than we used to. And so um, I, th I think for all of you in your roles, it's, it's really an interesting thing about how can you be the kind of the trusted source of information, knowing that people are looking at things differently. And you know, I had a lot of experience um, before I took my, my current role at Deloitte working in climate change for four or five years. And I mean, that is, uh, is if, if there's a space that's gonna change in the next 20 years more than any, anything more than health, it's probably the climate space and, and kind of the, the energy disruption that we're seeing today. And we face so many of these challenges around how, how do you communicate out to citizens when they, they kind of don't wanna maybe look at the data. They, they don't always kind of look to trusted sources of information. They look kind of from their own, uh, own perspectives. But you know, you, you know, we did find, and I'll talk a bit about you know, ways that you can engage effectively to really gain that trust. And then, um, I don't know, just maybe a quick show of hands. Does anyone know uh, Clinic Cloud? So it's, it's a Melbourne-based startup. Um, so I actually met with them a couple weeks ago. Uh, so they've got basically um, a device that's actually just launching this year, which is probably why uh, people haven't heard of them. That's basically a, um, it's a, a stethoscope and a thermostat. And it sort of looks like an iPhone. It's very sleekly designed. It actually allows you to feed all your uh, data into a common repository that you can keep around yourself. Uh, what is interesting is they've, they've, they're launching in the US first, and they're fusing this with an online doctor's appointment, right? And so, uh, you know, a lot of this is, you know, focused around like um, clinical treatment of children, right? A kid that may actually have like a, a condition that wants to be monitored by the parents, but it also involves a, an online discussion with a, with a doctor. Um, but uh, yeah, host, uh, close to home example of a, of a company that's uh, launching this year and is very much getting in, kind of tapping into this, this change of, of customer behavior. And as a prosumer, I'm probably going to buy one of the devices because they, they look cool. <laughs> um, so we talked about tech and how people are changing. I think a lot of you would, would sort of intuitively know that, right? So you know how you know, you're engaging differently with technology because you spend so much time on it. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to think about um, was the impact of kind of some of these major global trends. Um, sort of a passion area of mine is, is around emerging economies and, and what's happening there, with particularly around clean tech. So I worked, uh, launched a startup there about a year ago in this space. And so just finding some very interesting stories around kind of global trends around what's happening outside countries like Australia and the United States in places that we wouldn't have typically gone to before to see leadership examples in, in healthcare. Um, and so, you know, part of this, this kind of rise of these emerging economies is just the number of people that are actually coming into this connected system. So uh, we're looking at 3 billion people uh, over the next five years being connected to the internet. And so uh, companies like Google and Facebook are actually not just enabling this through their uh, technologies that you think of, like their search technology or their social technology, but also through connectivity. And so you've probably seen some examples of these, uh, these initiatives they've got with like kind of balloons flying in the air to connect people via the internet, or uh, solar powered uh, planes. There's all this really interesting stuff that's happening. But it's fundamentally about connecting everybody online. And, and so um, it's definitely happening. And you know, I, I interact in, in, in this other role with people. Um, we, we have writers that are mostly in East Africa. And I'm amazed at the young generation there, how, they are, how much they're engaged with the newest technologies. It's just fascinating. So one thing that we also need to think about, uh, and I haven't talked about this too much, is actually the, you know, what are some of the challenges with this, right? And so uh, I say healthcare data is, is the uh, cash cow of the hacker world. So um, yeah, credit card will kind of buy you on the black market, I think like 50 cents per credit card record. It's about 10, 10 to $20 per healthcare record. 
And the reason is that people are using this to actually buy, buy drugs illegally, so um, in terms of prescription drugs. So there, there's definitely uh, you know, major incentives to being able to get access to health records online, and it poses a lot of questions as we move to, say, cloud-based environments or even the, the, the environments that we have today. Um, the, you know, and fundamentally, you know, one of the rules of information security is if people uh, are going to make dramatically more money by actually hacking a system than it would cost them to actually access the system illegally, they'll, they'll put the money into it. So they'll spend, you know, a million dollars of, of, you know, effort to try to get to access to a system if there's a hundred million dollar benefit. And so it's no different than any other business models there, and it's something that we definitely need to be aware of. And so, yeah, this was the example I alluded to earlier. This is uh, um, one of the, the folks I work with, uh, um, Boris. He's, he's in Rwanda. He's, uh, um, he's 22 years old, and he actually um, told me about these uh, really cool devices that they were seeing in Rwanda that actually can do like a test for HIV and syphilis in about 15 minutes. And it actually just plugs into a mobile phone, so you don't even need like a separate power source. And so they actually just take a sample there, and yes, yeah, fundamentally changing people's lives, right? And so I think it was actually developed at uh, Columbia, in uh, Columbia University in the States. Uh, but uh, yeah, fundamentally they, they tested it in Rwanda, and it's actually, uh, it's been really, really a success. And so um, once again, kind of, it's, it's, you know, the mobile phone is actually just powering so many of these people's interactions. Um, so uh, Bianca talked a lot about some, some amazing things that Google is doing around, around search. Um, what's also really interesting is just what these big technology disruptors are doing generally in the healthcare space. So in 2014, 30% of Google Ventures dollars, and that's a significant amount of dollars, went into healthcare investments. Um, so I don't know, have, has anyone heard of Calico? Google's life extension company that they launched a couple of years ago? So specifically, you know, their, their mission is to cure aging. Right, and so um, they love big, interesting technology problems, whether it's space or robotics uh, or, or health. Um, but it's not just Google; it's Facebook has now launched an uh, initiative. Just uh, I think it was at the end of last year, around more of like a community-based approach to uh, health advice. Um, Apple is obviously in this space with the the Apple Watch, um, and and really pretty much any of the major tech players. So you look at look at Samsung. Uh, if you look at uh, um, even stuff that Amazon has launched re recently, uh, they see curing problems around health in, in to degree like areas like climate change is sort of um, uh, you know ways to diversify their companies going forward and really solve these big problems that haven't been solved. Um, so I kind of threw lots of stats and lots of kind of concepts, um, hopefully not too many, but what I want to do now is kind of give you some really kind of practical advice for your initiatives around how you can really prepare, but then respond to this reimagined healthcare environment. And so starting with like, okay, what would you do around like steps for an engagement, right? And so I see like fundamentally eight things. So first is really just putting the patient first. So if we're designing other systems for other industries all the time, we say put customer first, right? It's the same thing here. You fundamentally need to put the, the patient at the center of what you're doing. Um, and, and I'll share these uh, these slides with, with anyone. So. Um, uh, you, you can definitely get these from me. Um, the second is, is design thinking. And I'll talk a bit about what design thinking is for people that aren't familiar. Uh, but it's really putting, uh, once again, putting the human in the center of all the interactions. Um, you need to embrace disruptive technology. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening. But at the same time, focus on value. There's lots of new toys, right? And so actually trying to make sure that you've got a, an approach that really almost treats this like research. Right, and so think of like doing a specific research problem where you know there's a problem that you want to solve. Um, you know, do your your due diligence and you know your studies around what the technologies are around there. But it's got to focus around the value for for the patient, and value for you. It can't just be technology for technology's sake. Um, in terms of kind of catalyzing the future, um, it's about bringing some people in, right? So you might look even like people that uh, worked in different industries before, um, but it's about getting that kind of different perspective around healthcare that maybe you hadn't thought of. Look for these collisions, right? So look what's actually happened in other industries. Look at when you, think about when you use Uber, right? How that might actually impact a, a patient interaction. They'll, they'll give you ideas around what you can do. Um, don't, definitely don't try to do everything yourself. And so I think what is really interesting about Better Health Channel is it's fundamentally like an ecosystem where you bring in 200 different people with expertise as opposed to the, the organization trying to do everything itself. And that, that's the way to work in this kind of model. It's just too big and complex to do everything on your own. So look to partner with other organizations. And then finally, be a, be a sensing organization and communicate effectively. 
that, that, that's really the key in this kind of complex environment. And so um, when it comes to design thinking and kind of getting customer centric, there's really five steps. The, the first is, is building empathy. So understanding things really from the, the customer's or the patient's perspective. Uh, defining and ideating the solution, right? And actually kind of going into this process that's really gonna be very much a co-design, right? So you're actually not trying to do, you know, one or two individuals uh, working on the approach, but actually bringing multiple perspectives into the process and then quickly moving to where you're prototyping, right? So don't do these big gigantic projects. You're focused around prototyping, experimentation, things that you can actually do quickly. And some of these actually may not work. And so you obviously need to think about the types of projects that you can do that uh, where failure is not a big deal, right? Like a, like a digital type initiative and things that are closer to the patient where it's actually a very big deal. Um, but you know, those are the types of things that you need to do when you're defining you know, kind of the parameters of the approach and then very much testing and improving throughout. Um, in terms of understanding the, the patient experience and the, and, the, and the customer, there's really three elements to it. Um, so the first is that, that sort of big data or data problem around monitoring analytics. So looking at the intelligence that you have um, to actually try to tell you the story sort of about everything, right? But then, so kind of from this overall story around the data, getting into very specific interactions. So, um, um, so I'm working with a client where we do things called contextual inquiries. So we actually go out to people's homes, whether in kind of a more comfortable situation, and actually just talk to them around, you know, what, in this case, what they were looking for in terms of a product design. Um, and so we found that, you know, as opposed to like kind of traditional market research type surveys, people are a lot more comfortable talking about, you know, what, what they were really looking for. And it's a, it's a much more engaged experience. And then finally, you might do some observation, right? So which is actually a little bit more disconnected from the individual, but you're really trying to see how people are interacting. And so once again, um, in, in my experience at the uh, hospital last week, I could have been observing all the different interactions and sort of some frustrated parents, but also um, that, you know, fundamentally we were getting pretty well taken care of in the process as well. And, and so then just seeing what people react to positively and negatively, and, and really sensing that is actually the way to design this new experience. Um, I, I'm a Star Trek fan, so I couldn't resist uh, getting a tricorder in here. Um, but but uh, very much stay on the pulse of, of you know, what's going on. And exponential technology is going to happen fast, right? It's going to raise you know, big ethical questions around you know, things like data and artificial intelligence. And, and I don't think we have all the answers for that now. Um, what, what we need to do is actually see you know, what is possible with technology, but Realize at the same time, just because we can do it doesn't mean we should. And, and so um, stay on the pulse, um, you know, bring people around you that actually are into the technology and actually, but make sure that it is then coming back very much to the, the problem at hand. Um, once again, look for inspiration from other industries, look for these collisions, um, because I think that there's gonna be uh, things that you can learn from, from the industries that were more impacted by digital disruption as they go first, but but health is gonna is once again it's gonna dramatically change over the next couple of years from from these technologies that are coming. Um, be uh, very much a science communicator. So I, I learned this better than ever when I worked in climate change around the discipline and the importance of, of science communication. Uh, I think the Better Health Channel is is really good for this. Um, so uh, uh, one of my uh, my, my non-cran experience was a uh, burn on my wife's uh, leg, and so I was able to go to the site and actually look for some just good, quite practical advice. And I learned she was doing one thing really, really wrong in the process, uh, which was putting um, uh, Bennett. Uh, Benedine or I don't know. yeah, it was not the right thing to do. It was drying out, uh, drying out the burn, and so uh, we were actually able to uh, resolve the problem. So I think uh, you know you are really empowered in all your roles to um, uh, communicate the science properly. And, and I would tell you that this is uh, one solution I found online for a crayon up the nose. And so um, uh, and, and remember, like I'm a prosumer, right? So I'm going to go on Google and say like, okay, what what can I do? Get the crayon out and. And I found this uh, vacuum-based uh, solution with, uh, and, and so I didn't, I didn't try it, I thought about it. But, um, the, uh, but I, so I think you have a really important role around um, communicating the right scientific approach because um, otherwise uh, there, there's gonna be things on, I don't know if it's Distractify or one of the other sites where, um, they, yeah, this is, this is the solution I found. So um, uh, you have a very important role around how you communicate um, and just, uh, just always keep that in mind. Thank you.